Um, so, one, if you don't mind, I'm going to introduce you. Um, ah, there's Mario as well. Fantastic. Hello, Mario. Uh, you're, on, you're on mute, Mario. <clears throat> Mario, you're on mute. No, I said, go ahead, Asim. Uh, we know each other very well. Uh, Juan, welcome to uh, Montefiore. Thank you, Mario. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining our Grand Rounds uh, in the Division of Cardiology. Um, we've changed it this year, and our Grand Rounds are now uh, the first Tuesday of every month in the morning at 7.30, uh, and I hope that it's just easier for a lot of faculty and fellows to make it uh, to the Grand Rounds. Um, the first this year, it's really a pleasure to help <coughs> Juan Granada, who um, is known to many of us. Um, just give you a little bit of background for those of you who don't know Juan. Juan uh, trained in, in, um, in Medellin, Colombia, and he finished his cardiovascular and interventional cardiology fellowships at Baylor College in Houston, Texas. In 2007, he was recruited to New York, uh, where he was faculty at Columbia, and recruited to CRF, where he served as executive director and chief innovation officer at the Skirball Center for Innovation. And in his time in that role is when me, Antonio, many of us in this field got to know one uh, as a true innovator in interventional cardiology. He's been really at the pinnacle of research, of innovation, of translational medicine. Um, for those of you who don't know Skirball, it does a lot of preclinical work. Um, and so many of the devices actually we implant today clinically uh, underwent some of their preclinical work at Skirball. And one has been really a true pioneer in helping companies and innovators and inventors take their, their ideas from you know, uh, uh, really a drawing on a on, a, on the back of a paper towel into animals and then patients. Recently, one's been, uh, I think it's two years now, maybe a little longer, that one has become now the president and chief executive officer of CRF. Uh, and that role has really transformed some of the large interventional meetings such as TCT uh, into a meeting that continues to grow and hopefully will continue to grow in person when we get out of COVID. Um, one, I can't say enough about you and how much I learned from you, but probably the two most important things I'm going to say about you is the one is that I count you as a very close friend, and I'm very delighted to say that. And the second um, for the staff to know is that one has joined Monty as faculty recently. Uh, we managed to steal him away from uh, Colombia, and so we really feel honored and privileged to count you amongst our faculty at Monty. Sim uh, and Mario, first of all, thank you for uh, the invitation and uh, Sim, thank you for the uh, generous uh, introduction and it's been uh, a real pleasure and honor to uh, be able to interact with you and, and other uh, Montefiore's uh, faculty uh, in the cath lab has been an unbelievable experience uh, for me. So thank you for, uh, you know, embrace my uh, presence and essentially, uh, you know, uh, enhance what I do. It's been a phenomenal opportunity, uh, as I said. So what I'm going to do uh, in this talk is try to put things uh, a little bit in perspective uh, when it comes down to uh, innovation on the um, structural heart field, um, focused mainly on transcatheter mitral valve uh, technologies. This is actually a very challenging field to talk about because number one, the amount of data that has been accumulated over the years on the surgical field, the heterogeneity of the patients with mitral regurgitation, um, and actually the conflicting data that we have from uh, surgical and some interventional trials uh, as well. So what I'm going to do is talk a little bit about innovation, talk a little bit about the, uh, the, the data, the potential actually future of, uh, of uh, the field. I'm gonna talk about some technologies and how I feel the, uh, how I actually feel the, uh, the field is going to move forward uh, in the future. This is my disclosure statement. Uh, I'm a co-founder of one of the transcatheter valve technologies. 
that are right now under investigation, but I'm not going to um, uh, extensively talk about, uh, you know, these uh, technology. Before we talk about the history of innovation in the structural space, um, I wanna clarify a couple of concepts that I really think are important because innovation, when people talk about innovation, I always say is one of the most, you know, mistreated uh, words um, in uh, medicine. And uh, there are big difference between iteration and actually disruption. And iteration happens when changes improve action. So little changes on what we do that change a little bit the field. Disruption happens when something new comes in and essentially makes what we do either obsolete or change completely uh, the way we do uh, things in any field. This is important to essentially talk about the reasons why the surgical field um, was disrupted by the technologies we have today. I'm not going to talk about Taver innovation, but I just wanna make the, the case and present the reason why Taver was, uh, uh, has been so successful and the reason why it disrupted the surgical field and why this is important to understand what is coming next. In aortic stenosis, one of the big differences is that besides the clinical risk, I think it's fair to say that the aortic stenosis is a pretty homogeneous disease. And actually that made things relatively simple. In the surgical uh, AVR uh, uh, field for years, all the innovation was actually uh, uh, focused on iteration, what we call iterative innovation, leaflet design, valve design, durability, thrombogenicity. And the major improvements were towards improve, improving actually long-term outcomes refinement of the AVR procedure, minimally invasive aortic surgery, and that allowed to increase the yield from low intermediate risk to actually a higher risk of patients. But one of the things that actually happened in the aortic valve uh, uh, and the aortic stenosis field is that the, the, the field, the innovation focused on long-term results of the surgical uh, uh, valve replacement technologies. And actually there were big unmet clinical needs and opportunities uh, that essentially were left behind, such as limited options for aortic stenosis in prohibited and high-risk uh, patients and the potential to improve pre-procedural outcomes. And this was actually, these two uh, factors were the gate that essentially propelled TAVR uh, into the uh, disrupting in the surgical field. And the story is actually pretty remarkable. You actually see, um, there was actually only four, uh, a few years before the implantation of the TAVR balloon expanding uh, valve and actually the approval by the FDA of the first generation valve. We're talking about eight years that in innovation years is not really a lot. And you really see that from the first approval to pretty much going into low risk population, you're talking about less than a decade. This is really remarkable when you're actually talking about a technology entering a mature field to disrupt the field, uh, such as actually surgical aortic valve uh, replacement. But let's talk about the future. I'm not gonna talk more about actually TAVR here. I'm going to stop here and just to talk about what I really think the future innovation in TAVR is going to be because TAVR is getting now into a very mature uh, iterative uh, phase. And I think that actually uh, further uh, improvements going to be on simplifying uh, the technique, making the technique simpler, vascular access and closure, the use of embolic protection or not, valve uh, design iteration to improve PVL, et cetera, et cetera, and leaflet durability and thrombogenicity, which I think for me is the most important factors on innovation that will determine the future of this technology, especially in the low risk uh, population. Innovation in mitral valve intervention is different. And this is actually important because people actually tend to compare the TAVR field with the mitral field. And in the mitral field is different because besides the risk, uh, a clinical risk population that we manage in, in mitral regurgitation, we also have to include different disease conditions that actually are grouped into a single disease entity. We have patients with DMR and FMR that are different from every single uh, point of view that actually you take a look at it. But again, innovation in the surgical field and in, in the mitral space is also being about improvement 
of actually the surgical tools, you know, valves, the introduction of robotics, introduction of minimal invasive surgery towards the improvement of long-term results in actually good surgical candidates. Something happened to this field that didn't happen to the aortic field that has made actually this field a little bit more confusing and also actually difficult to validate uh, new technologies and is the introduction of MitroClip and the introduction of catheter-based H2H repair essentially disrupted the field by expanding the indication to high-risk patients in both DMR and FMR. But it's still there are unmet needs and opportunities that actually are important to continue uh, uh, improving innovation and new technologies in this field, such as the treatment of FMR in high uh, surgical risk patients, the uh, patients that actually are called unclippable or actually hostile mitral anatomies, and the improvement again of post-surgical outcomes. Whether these technologies in the mitral field can walk back into high risk, intermediate risk, and low risk need to be determined, but for sure is going to be more challenging for mitral technologies than it was for aortic uh, technologies. The reality is there has been a, a massive amount of investment and enthusiasm and work that has been done in the mitral field, uh, both on the repair and the replacement um, uh, space. This is actually a list that is outdated, I could feel, two slides of technologies that continue to emerge, trying to replicate some of the surgical uh, techniques and actually tools. And it's an extremely exciting uh, field as actually the technology is mature and we understand the benefit challenges and potential benefits of these technologies. So let's start talking about why is innovation needed in the mitral space? Because a lot of people actually challenge the notion we have you know, a very good uh, field that is actually mature. We have actually good uh, surgical uh, centers and the data seems to be very robust. One of the main reasons why innovation is needed in the mitral space is because I think there is a huge unmet you know, clinical need. The high risk MR population continues to grow and as actually patients age, I really think the proportion of patients with um, uh, mitral regurgitation will continue to increase, especially in a high-risk population, which is actually interesting. This high-risk population is frequently rejected from surgery, and these patients are actually frequently treated uh, medically, especially FMR patients. They are not well represented in clinical trials, so I don't really think we can say we have enough data on those patients to justify one treatment or the other. And typically, actually, high-risk uh, patients, you know, have poor surgical outcomes and actually present a high financial burden to the healthcare systems, especially due to rehospitalizations due to uh, heart failure. We know that mitral regurgitation uh, is actually bad and severity impacts long-term survival. If you have a severe MR and you're treated medically, your long-term survival actually is going to be decreased easily by 50% up to five years. This is a paper that I really like a lot because essentially shows and represents what happens uh, in a lot of um, uh, healthcare uh, centers around the world. Um, this is a, a group of patients, approximately 1,000 patients with a, a moderate to severe MR and heart failure that were seen between 2000 and 2008. 74% were FMR, 21% DMR, which is interesting is the tendency where it's very similar to what happens in most of the, uh, of the uh, heart failure centers and interventional centers. Most of the patients with DMR underwent surgery, 84%. The FMR uh, patients actually most commonly underwent medical therapy or were actually kept in medical therapy. But the important thing is actually the control groups, the ones that actually didn't, didn't actually uh, undergo any surgical procedures, typically had lower ejection fractions and higher STS scores. And if you see the mortality on those patients was approximately 50% at five years and rehospitalization for heart failure continued to increase almost to have a universal uh, uh, hospitalization rate of 100%, 90 to 100% at five years. This is actually a different analysis uh, done by CRF, and it's interesting if you look at the paper, approximately 36% of those patients, you know, had criteria for mitroclip. So patients that could have been potentially treated with uh, mitroclip and could have been potentially uh, um, um, 
gotten better with the uh, use of these uh, technology. Another important consideration about why is innovation needed in mitral space is that the final goal, which is mitral valve intervention, can be achieved with potentially fewer short-term perioperative uh, complications. And that has been, you know, uh, uh, the, the, the source of innovation in the surgical space about making incisions smaller, smaller, and smaller. This is important because progression towards minimal invasive interventions, we know that impact clinical outcomes, especially short-term outcomes, quality of life, and overall healthcare cost. You decrease hospitalization rate, you decrease the number of uh, days the patients stay in the hospital and you essentially potentially decrease complications. This is one of the papers that has been um, uh, one of the landmark papers in the surgical literature that essentially compare repair versus replacement in severe ischemic uh, mitral regurgitation. Great surgeons, great centers, highly selected patients. And if you actually see the uh, cumulative uh, 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 complication rates in both groups at 30 days is actually north of 10%. Some of these complications like the renal flagler, bleeding and sepsis and respiratory failure could, I say could potentially be improved by catheter-based minimal invasive uh, techniques. Also one thing that actually we know is operator volume impacts directly uh, mitral valve repair success and outcomes. The problem is in the US and especially out of the US, access to high level surgical care is variable. Not everyone actually has great surgeons and not everyone actually has great intensive care uh, units to take care of these patients after surgery is done. So broader treatment access and standardization of techniques is more easily achieved with catheter-based approaches, especially in that high risk population area that can be uh, um, you know, helped with the introduction of new uh, repair and replacement uh, techniques. So where is innovation needed in the mitral space? This is another um, um, very frequent uh, question. And there are actually, on my opinion, two misconceptions. The first one is FMR is better. Is a better field, is it easier to get into, there is less data, DMR is crowded and pretty much already taken care of. And the second actually concept is maybe actually mitral valve repair is better than replacement. Based on actually uh, data from uh, surgical actually registries. And, and I think it's fair to say that in general, there is a tendency to say repair is better than replacement. And cardiac surgeons, especially when the anatomy, you know, is amenable to that for sure, you know, repair is the uh, preferred method of uh, uh, intervention. But let's look at the data because the data is actually quite uh, confusing and, and sometimes actually contradicts in different centers. I actually chose this paper because it's coming from Cleveland Clinic um, in which they essentially presented their entire series of mitral patients. When you actually look at the unmatched analysis, there is a strong preference towards actually repair, but when actually they match the data, something really interesting happens. If you look at the preference for replacement, is actually a specifically older age, patient with more complex anatomy, mitral valve cal cal calcification, or the surgeon that actually made the decision to do repair or replacement. So there is actually in a way an extrinsic uh, bias towards repair and patient selection is influenced by patient demographics, valve anatomy, comorbid conditions, and more importantly, surgical uh, uh, expertise. In this, in this same uh, paper, once the um, um, groups were actually matched for comorbid conditions, for ejection fraction and, and, and everything, pretty much the outcomes were very similar. And the conclusion is it is reasonable to perform valve repair in elderly patients with complex uh, DMR because it can eliminate the need for anticoagulation and risk of prosthesis related complications. However, when valve pathology is so complex that repair is invisible, this study demonstrates the valve replacement doesn't diminish long-term uh, outcomes. What about FMR? Because this is what has been called at the very beginning of this field, the low hanging fruit. Despite the fact that surgical uh, data on improvement of outcomes in surgical intervention of FMR is actually quite uh, uh, controversial. If you actually see, uh, this is one of the best uh, papers um, on, on this field, uh, mitral valve repair versus replacement for severe ischemic mitral regurgitation, a randomized study. 
251 patients randomized into groups, small study, MVR versus repair versus replacement. At 12 months, no significant differences in left ventricular and systolic volume index, mortality or composite cardiac endpoint, but there was a significant difference in the recurrence of moderate to severe MR. I know the limitations of this paper, and actually this is a very high recurrence rate compared to other series, but the reality is, again, when you look at the papers, the differences between repair and replacement do not really seem to be uh, that significant when the patients are essentially matched uh, by uh, clinical um, uh, conditions. These results were maintained up to two years, essentially showing uh, the same trend towards you know, equality of outcomes after two years in this particular series. One of the things that we have learned on the surgical literature and we continue to see also on the interventional literature uh, with MitoClip and so forth is the importance of maintaining a very, or actually achieving a very good repair. And unless repair decreases mitral regurgitation significantly, the recurrence of mitral regurgitation over time tends to be uh, higher. So one of the things is for any transcatheter technologies to be able to be successful, really the abolition of MR, you know, uh, really has to happen. Otherwise, um, you know, I'm afraid that the outcomes are not going to be, you know, as good as the ones reported by good repairs in the surgical literature. We know as it happened in TAVR that actually leaving MR behind and having recurrence of MR over time is a marker of mortality. So post-op residual MR impacts long-term outcomes. And we actually know that and residual MR must be greatly minimized also in the transcatheter mitral valve repair um, space. Where do I see uh, that transcatheter mitral repair can really have an important impact? impact? I really think is on those specific anatomical abnormalities that could be repaired, avoiding the surgical trauma. I mean, this is a great example, uh, neocord, that they are now replacing uh, uh, cords uh, in patients with uh, uh, tricuspid regurgitation that actually need cordal replacement. The uh, uh, experience is being very, very uh, uh, interesting with actually large amount of patients. Trust apically, they can achieve results you know, like this in a patient that has significant MR and could benefit of a cordial replacement and transapical uh, replacement essentially, it's an excellent uh, surgical um, uh, result, surgical-like result. So in a specific ab anatomical abnormalities in which, for example, the amount of intervention is not big enough to be able to require, you know, an open chest could be potentially be an interesting alternative for uh, these patients. Another example, uh, we have, um, uh, for example, for patients with mitral posterior leaflet repair, this is one of the technology that is under development that is called the mitral butterfly. You see a regurgitation uh, with flail on the posterior leaflet and with a, a catheter-based technique, you know, um, there are potential uh, development of um, uh, enhancers or actually devices that essentially push the uh, posterior leaflet up by potentially repairing the, uh, the uh, defect. This is another uh, potential example. This is actually called uh, half moon in uh, patients that actually have posterior leaflet tethering, that that device by essentially having an enhancer and filler essentially uh, produces full coaptation of the mitral valve, improving this condition in patients that have focal structural abnormalities that can be potentially uh, fixed with catheter-based uh, techniques. Another important population that um, is essentially growing and capturing the attention of innovator, innovators is what is called the unclippable patients. Patients that are not candidates for surgery, but patients that are not good candidates for catheter-based techniques, specifically H2H uh, uh, repair. This population essentially right now is a population that is uh, undergoing of labeled procedures like, you know, Valva in MAC. And I think that this uh, is a population that is strongly favors uh, replacement, transcatheter replacement as a specific, uh, a specific anatomical abnormality is unsuitable for mitral valve uh, repair. Because it's actually easier to uh, do 
and essentially fix the problem actually completely. The field of transcatheter mitral intervention is moving a little bit more towards actually uh, replacement. It's actually easier to implant. Essentially, the technology is agnostic uh, of the etiology of MR. It can work on DMR or FMR, eliminates completely MR, and essentially could potentially decrease the recurrence of MR. But the challenges are significant. You have to go with a big valve in a small catheter, cross the septum, have enough flexibility to essentially go uh, navigate through the atrium, go into the annulus, and in a very predictable fashion, essentially deploy the valve in a perfect location. It's not, it's not as easy as actually uh, it sounds, and technologically speaking, is a significant challenge. But essentially the field is moving slowly, but in a very interesting uh, pace. Let's see what are the clinical and technical challenges of this field, which are actual uh, significant. One of the most important um, uh, limitations or challenges, as I said before, is that the clinical risk uh, profile and anatomical considerations influence mitral intervention and technique selection. This is not like aortic stenosis. You have an stenosis. The anatomy is somewhat actually homogeneous. The procedure can be standardized. Here we're dealing with actually two conditions or multiple conditions, group on one, some that affect more the annulus and the leaflets, more actually others that affect more the muscle and, and distortion of the, uh, the muscle and the geometry. And if you start actually grouping the categories on clinical risk for the anatomy, you end up with multiple configurations of risk and indications. At the present time, no question that actually surgery is the standard of care uh, in patients that actually have anatomy that is suitable and the surgical risk is actually uh, acceptable according to the expertise in the center. As I said before, mitra clip right now is falling kind of in the middle and trying to go into the intermediate risk of surgical uh, patients. And at the present time, TMVR is at the uh, prohibited risk group and trying to understand what is the best way to essentially uh, move uh, uh, forward. Mitra clip has been a phenomenal uh, um, uh, success story, mainly because essentially allowed the understanding and the potential of mitral uh, catheter-based intervention and the impact on clinical outcomes. The, the, the fact that actually improved survival and improved rehospitalization and quality of life essentially has been fantastic. At the same time, has made actually more challenging to treat these patients because now the algorithm of decision-making process has to include a technology like MitroClip uh, to be able to actually make it to TMVR, making sure the patient could potentially be treated with mitroclip or not before we make that decision. Another important, actually, uh, clinical challenge, as I said before, is we all not only have multiple etiologies, but also different stages of severity with different uh, degrees of distortion of the ventricle, the annulus, and the subvalvular apparatus. So it is challenging to develop a universal device concept tailored to target all potential anatomical variations seen in all the patients. So very likely we're going to end up with different tools that are more indicated for certain type of anatomies. And it's going to be difficult to pretty much get a device that covers all different configurations of anatomical variations. This was actually very apparent when we started to do a screening for clinical trials in, in this field. The designs were essentially um, uh, thought out by engineers according to what they thought it was the best approach. Some are D-shaped, some are actually circular, some are actually softer, some are actually stronger. But also when you start screening these patients, you start to find a lot of anatomical variations that were not really thought out before. The degree of annular calcification, leaflet calcification, also the uh, uh, septal uh, abnormalities, and the uh, subannular structures as well that essentially have made very challenging the universal use of these technologies in all these uh, patients. One of the issues at the very beginning that uh, uh, created a lot of anxiety in technology developers and clinicians was the mechanism of anchoring. Engineers have actually figured out a way to anchor these devices in the right position. And at the present time, actually, believe it or not, one of the biggest fears <clears throat> 
essentially have disappeared. And anchor of these devices have become very predictable with very low failure uh, uh, rates. The biggest actually issue and challenge that we have right now is uh, LVOT uh, obstruction and uh, mitral annular calcification. And that has essentially uh, created a lot of difficulties for the field to move forward with very high rejection rates in these patients as the possibility of LVOT obstruction um, can be actually significant, especially in patients with, with uh, uh, small uh, ventricles. The problem is the prediction algorithms are highly dependent on design uh, features. And it's difficult to standardize at the present time or actually predict what are the patients that are at risk in every single device concept. And actually every single algorithm is being individualized for every single type of a company. So let's see what data do we have right now. Um, most of the data we have at the present time on the, the replacement uh, field is uh, being uh, achieved with the transapical systems. The reason is because we're talking about big valves that need to be packed in the small catheters and to make sure that actually the valve doesn't really break and maintains mechanical stability, these uh, devices are packed in approximately 30 French uh, devices, which are actually very big. Most of them uh, at the present time implanted transapicola. These are the four companies that have um, uh, really recruited the uh, largest number of uh, patients uh, to date. This is one of the examples of the uh, Evoke system with uh, Edwards that has a supraannular uh, component, trying to minimize the amount of uh, hardware or metallic components into the LVOT. As you can actually uh, see here with the anchoring mechanism, having pretty much these fingers grabbing the leaflets, you know, um, uh, from uh, below. This is the tendine system with Abbott that is also transapical, uh, that essentially works by uh, having a tether that is uh, put at the uh, apex, as you can actually see here, and secure at the apex uh, by essentially mechanical forces and the sutures. This is the, the uh, uh, valve, uh, transapical valve, that perhaps has been studied the most. These are the first 100 patients that were recently uh, published, essentially showing very high implantation uh, success rate with low um, complications, uh, uh, the per, uh, periprocedural complications, and relatively actually low uh, mortality at 30 days, but as you can see here, 26% uh, mortality one year in a patient population that is actually very high uh, at risk. But you actually see that the number of complications and mortality is not insignificant in these uh, first uh, series of uh, patients. This is the intrepid system that essentially anchors by mechanical uh, uh, compression, is relatively soft, so allows the uh, compression and adaptability on the mitral uh, apparatus. And as actually has been shown by the other systems, you see pretty much the, uh, the uh, disappearance of the mitral regurgitation having 100% of the patients none or mild after the procedure. But again, you actually see the, the mortality rate up to two years is approximately uh, 45 to 50%. Again, these are patients that are very high risk, very complicated with actually very high STS uh, uh, scores. Right now, two technologies um, committed to actually go on randomized control studies, the Tendine system with Abbott, uh, randomizing against MitroClep in a US-based study, and the Intrepid system that actually is modifying the design to become single arm but the original design was to randomize against uh, surgery in actually high risk uh, uh, surgical uh, patients. So we will know, you know more about the real safety efficacy profile of these technologies in the near future. But everybody wants to move into transeptal delivery and the technical challenges are significant. If it was difficult to compress 30 French plus devices in transapical systems, it's actually even more challenging to essentially make it work for transvenous uh, systems. It's not only because the forces, but also because the fatigability issue on the materials and the navigability issues and coaxiality uh, challenges. There are also some concerns about when you go beyond 27 French, which is the microclip uh, uh, system size, going beyond 27 uh, French, the possibility to essentially leave a big hole in the septum, the potential risk for that, 
and actually opens a multiple uh, set of uh, complex uh, questions uh, as well. So the transition to transseptal systems of uh, clinically available, available uh, TNVR devices will require important changes and engineer modifications in size possibly valve design and anchoring uh, mechanisms. In order to be able to decrease the profile size, this is actually one of the uh, most interesting uh, advances. This is the uh, uh, Sapien M3 system by Edwards that essentially has a two-step approach and being two-step essentially diminish, is able to decrease the amount of uh, material that is needed to put in a catheter. It's a two-step approach, as I said, in which first there is a cinch that is actually put underneath the annulus. And then as a second step, a modified sapient valve essentially put as a valve in ring configuration. First 35 patients, very interesting data, feasibility data of uh, safety, uh, a program that is actually moving uh, relatively uh, fast with a very good preliminary uh, results. This is another system, the system that actually now I call a single step because everything is integrated into a single uh, delivery system. This is the Evoke uh, system that I showed before transapically. Now this is transeptally. And essentially the concept is to put the fingers again underneath the leaflets as you can actually see here. Then when the leaflets uh, essentially are you know, captured, the uh, supraannular component is uh, released as you can actually see here uh, by echo. You see you know, very nicely how the leaflets are grabbed. And then this is the full uh, deployment of the uh, device. Again, very small number of patients, feasibility data, just to prove feasibility of deployment, safety, and uh, efficacy. This is again, the uh, trans uh, 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 septal system for Intrepid, the one that I showed before for Metronic with a very similar mechanism of deployment of the transapical system. The atrial component is deployed first, as you can actually see here. Once the atrial component is uh, deployed, the system is completely released, the valve is completely released and anchors by mechanical uh, compression. Approximately seven patients have been done to date, essentially gaining experience with full transvenous transeptal systems. This is the system that we uh, developed uh, at Skirbel in collaboration with Abbott. Uh, the company is uh, owned by Abbott right now. The name is Sefea, it's also a single, um, step actually system, as you see here, the catheter is advanced transvenously. The uh, first uh, uh, ventricular disc is uh, deployed. Then the device is pulled up, as you can actually see here. Once it's actually pulled up, the atrial disc is released, having full apposition of the device. We published the first actually series, approximately seven patients uh, have been done to date and the EFS of this uh, uh, trial of this uh, technology will start um, after the uh, summer. It is amazing to really see, this is the first case we did with Tomas Mudin and Leo, the fast recovery of these patients with a simple you know, transvenous uh, uh, puncture. This is 24 hours after the procedure. This is two years after the procedure with very good function functionality of the valve and a, a, a group of patients that are clinically stable. And I really think in this group of patients, you know, the potential impact of this technology and rehospitalization and quality of life can be significant over time. So the future of the TMVR field, I really think we all agree, um, has to be transeptal as it happened on TAVR, you know, moving into minimal invasive, true uh, transvenous, uh, minimal invasive approach but multiple changes really need to occur very quickly to be able to increase uh, patient adoption and uh, uh, the inclusion of real world patients. Adapt the design to fit multiple anatomical variations, performing the real world anatomy, especially MAC patients, being able to pack these devices in a smaller catheter, which is right now one of the biggest challenges. And one important thing is evolution of imaging, planning, guidance, and, and training. This is actually a race, but not as fast as actually everybody thought it was going to be with a lot of details and re-engineering that is gonna to have to happen as the field moves forward. One of the things that I wanna emphasize again is the field is started in the high risk prohibited uh, risk actually group as it happened in Tavern. But the standards actually on mitral are very, very, very high. 
And I really think these technologies need to follow the same um, uh, level of performance in the future as it happened with mitral surgery. Minimize recurrent MR, minimize uh, uh, thromboembolic complications, and minimize late um, uh, regurgitation um, uh, in the past. And this is actually extremely, extremely important uh, for this field to move forward. The development of the TAVR timelines were very, very fast, as I showed before. In less than 10 years, the technology moved from compassionate use to intermediate risk use, and it was really remarkable. In the TMBR field, it's been actually quite slow. I and mean, in the first eight years, we're just slowly getting into feasibility trials with the transeptal system. So this is going to be a long walk, uh, mainly because all the challenges and competitive technologies but I personally feel the, the, the field is moving at a very strong uh, pace, but it's going to take some time compared to the tower field. I'm not going to talk about tricuspid. I know Becky um, Han is gonna talk about tricuspid innovation in the future, but there is one thing that I wanna um, you know, say about tricuspid is the fact that mitral surgery, especially repair in a, in a good surgical patients made significant impact on, on mortality survival of these patients. One of the things that we started to recognize ignited by the development of transcatheter technologies is that tricuspid regurgitation is not a, a bystander innocent and has an important um, actually uh, impact on morbidity, mortality, survival and quality of life. And the recognition of tricuspid regurgitation over time has really been now more apparent. And this has really opened and created the same level of enthusiasm on the tricuspid field. Um, and I really think the uh, interaction of mitral intervention, tricuspid intervention, recurrence of tricuspid uh, intervention in patients that actually undergo mitral surgery in the future is gonna be very, very interesting. And I really think the explosion of the uh, structural heart disease over the next decade is going to be uh, innovation in structural heart disease uh, is going to be very, very uh, interesting. So just to finish uh, in conclusions, uh, catheter-based valve intervention or a structural intervention is today one of the most exciting and potentially promising fields in interventional innovation. Unlike TAVR, specific device attributes will influence patterns of technology use, clinical outcomes, and physician adoption. The successful development of this field depends on a proper thoughtful and stepwise validation approach, including a clear definition of the target disease population, refinement of imaging and code registration tools, and lessons learned from early feasibility studies have led technological improvements already and trial design strategies in this exciting field. So I'm going to stop here, um, Azim and Mario, and if you have any questions, um, please let's start the, uh, the discussion. I, I'm going to have the prerogative of asking the first question, Juan, and making, uh, uh, first of all, the comment that uh, this was a phenomenal uh, presentation. I do remember visiting you at Skirvel, uh just about a time when I came uh, first to Monty about 10 years ago, and I remember you already showing me uh, uh, <laughs> some of the first trans uh, catheter mitral valve replacement systems. So. Uh, for fellows that think that, that you can write an IRB and in two months uh, you get one of these innovations uh, already applied, it takes a little bit longer than that. It so, takes time. <laughs> it uh, takes time. You, you did mention one thing that I think is very, very important uh, here is that functional MR is a completely different uh, animal than everything else. And in fact, the generative MR, I would put it closer to uh, uh, Taber in, in the sense exactly. that you're working with, um, with uh, people that have normal ventricles to begin with. Uh, the, the, there are very few degenerative MR patients that end up uh, with, uh, with a bad ventricle nowadays. It has to be completely mismanagement uh, over a long period of time. Whereas in degenerative MR, you start with a bad ventricle uh, and you get MR as a secondary <laughs> phenomenon. One of the challenges that I've seen here in this field is A, that there is a lot of effort in evaluating uh, 
the structure and the function of the microvalve apparatus uh, in the design of the devices and in the, in the design of the trials, not so much in the assessment of left ventricular function, still using very primitive method of assessment that we know don't work, like uh, looking at the ejection fraction. Paul Grayborn, as you know, and Milton Packer had a nice editorial uh, when they compare the Mitro FR with the co-op and basically very simple analysis looking at size of the ventricle and severity of MR and how if you are looking at a small ventricle with less MR, you are more likely to get a great long-term survival if you have a larger ventricle, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, um, less, uh, small ventricle with, with a lot of MR versus a larger ventricle with less MR when you get worse outcomes. But I think uh, moving forward, uh, that's one, one challenge that, that you, have, you have in this field is to carefully be able to determine uh, ventricular function and contractile reserve, and also differentiate ischemic from non-ischemic uh, MR. I think in, in looking at long-term outcomes, uh, the, the ischemic and the non-ischemic patients are, are, are different uh, animals and, and they're usually bundled in this category. You're, you're right on. I mean, people sometimes try to simplify the field into, you know, two conditions and, and um, there are a lot of shades of, of gray. Um, and I really think that uh, a lot of research um, is going to have to happen to be able to clarify the real impact of some of these technologies in these uh, population subsets. There's no question about it. Yeah, you know. I would add to that and to what Mario says, you know, just for the faculty and fellows, that we're still trying to learn exactly who are the patients who will respond in a dramatic way to, to transcatheter therapies, a reduction of the mitral regurgitation in the setting of heart failure. You know, I think the, the whole proportionate, disproportionate concept is one way of looking at it. Um, and it's certainly allows us to have some understanding of the fact that we need to separate out the patients who maybe the ventricle is the cause of their symptoms and not the valve. But we shouldn't also, you know, use it to say that once the ventricle is dilated, if you don't fit into the co criteria, you will not benefit from reduction in your mitral regurgitation. And that's one of the concerns I have is that you know, now a little bit, we use this quiet criteria, and if your ventricle is more dilated than that, you don't benefit. And that's not completely true. We, I mean, we've seen, you know, particularly from the European experience and the real world experience in Europe, that even patients with very dilated ventricles and ejection pressures of 20 can have a lot of symptomatic benefit from a mitral clip. They may not have the mortality benefit that we saw in co-app, but they can still have symptomatic benefit. And in a, in a heart failure patient who has such bad orthopnea that they you know, have to sleep lying, sitting up, decreasing symptoms is also important. That's right. On uh, Listen, uh, I think one of the things is I had a slide that um, um, I, I chose not to present is a little bit complex, but that explains the reason why, you know, sometimes innovation you know, works on improving long-term outcomes, survival and, and uh, you know, hardcore endpoints. But sometimes actually short-term endpoints have a massive impact in quality of life, symptom relief, rehospitalization, and actually cost. And some of these patients actually spend tremendous amount of resources and actually suffer a lot because they continue to come to the hospital uh, to rehospitalized you know, with heart failure symptoms. So you're absolutely right on. Some of these technologies can really make a dramatic improvement, even if it's, you know, for, you know, three to five years. Um, we, have a world, we have a world-class panel here for those, I mean, most of you who join our CAT conferences know Dr. Gruber and Dr. Colombo, who are also world so experts in the if, field. If, so I'm gonna let, as Everhard, I see you dying to ask a question or make a comment. Go ahead, please. I know time time has uh, has advanced, but uh, Juan, you know, I've listened very carefully, and this is probably one of the best lectures that I've heard for a long time on uh, on on the mitral field. You 
basically put everything to the right perspective. You, you discuss all the issues, all the problems, um, in a very balanced um, uh, way. And I, 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 I was really impressed by the way you put things into perspective. Um, I don't want to go into any details because you touched on, on every single topic that is important, uh, partially resolved, still partially unresolved. Unfortunately, I believe in the mitral field, there are more unresolved than resolved issues. Uh, but it was a very impressive, um, a very impressive lecture, a real, a real keynote lecture and grand round lecture. So one thing that I'd like to ask you, your perspective, you put the model clip very appropriately into the field and always added it in your decision-making uh, tree. You know, the, the co-app in, in many ways, it's, it's a blessing and a curse. And exactly. we see, unfortunately, that, you know, people are doing what maybe sometimes they shouldn't be doing. We're extending indications. We're using off-label indications for the clip because it's a safe procedure and the results are better than not doing anything. Um, you know, we, we come now with Greg saying, well, you know, even with, if you leave with two plus or three plus, the patients have a benefit. That drives the field, at least in my view, a little bit into the wrong direction um, because we should not be satisfied with something that is maybe okay in the future. We should still thrive for optimal results. And what's your perspective? Mitral clip on one side and the innovative field on the other side, because every time we come up with a question, we have to compare it to the clip both on safety and efficacy, um, are, we, um, are we stuck in a one-way street now with mitral clip? How do we get out of this clip grip, if I say, uh, looking at innovations? Everard, first of all, you know, thank you for your comments. It means a lot uh, coming, coming from you. Um, uh, number two, I really think that, as, as you said, uh, uh, the data with uh, MitroClip has really made things very challenging in this field. Um, the problem is, and this is one of the things people don't really talk about, is, is MitroClip is not really a study that um, is easily reproducible. And I don't really think that really represents what happens in, in the real world. Because if you actually look at the algorithm that was followed, you know, patients were selected, patients were monitored, patients were actually um, um, fully, um, um, even actually uh, analyzed by multiple experts to actually look at the suitability of the intervention. I mean, it's a study that I it cannot really, I don't really think that you can really do co-op to because the complexity of the trial. Um, the thing is what happens in the real world is not quite what actually what happened in co-apt. Um, and as you actually said, I really believe that leaving um, mitral regurgitation behind, even if it's actually two plus in the long term, um, as actually has been shown in the surgical literature, is not really going to work over time. So I really think that you know you can present one year, actually two years, but when you actually compare that against technology that can truly, you know, abolish or decrease MR, you know, significantly over time. I'd really think that um, we're going to actually see an edge towards the development of these uh, uh, other technologies. The problem is we need to really go over that hump and being able to start, you know, demonstrating some level of superiority to be able to, to, to do that because MitroClip got first and uh, these edge to edge repairs are going to be here always as the first technology to use and actually to compete for patients as well. It's been a challenge and it's going to be a challenge as you actually said. Right. Thank you, Juan. Um, before I move to Antonio, uh, I'm sure he has a question as well. There was a question from um, one of the participants, one of our fellows, about, um, you know, you mentioned volume, right, and surgical op operator experience about how important it is for mitral valve repair and the success of the repair. Um, any comments? I know there's some data out there on the learning curve when it comes to percutaneous procedures? Uh, are they more reproducible? Or also, you know, 
do you need to choose your mitral clip operator carefully? Like you choose your, Look, your as, surgical operator. As, 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 as uh, you know, everything in life, obviously, I mean, it depends on the person, the side and everything. But, but the thing is, what is interesting is if you actually look at the availability of, of repair surgeons, I mean, if you really count the number of surgeons that have high volume of repairs, that can't really do repairs the way that were described by DeBakey and others, um, you know, several decades ago, you can really count them in, in, in your right hand. I mean, it's really, really the, the high volume operators. And also, you know, surgeons, I mean, this is more like an art. They repair the valve in the way they think is the best way and they achieve phenomenal results. The reproducibility of that technique over multiple centers is very difficult to achieve. If you go, for example, to Latin America, the number of surgeons that you're going to find doing high volume repair is, is, is close to, I don't want to say none, but it's difficult to actually find. One of the beauties of, of catheter-based techniques is that you can reproduce and standardize the procedures. And if you actually look at MitroClip, despite the fact there are differences in the skills, interpretation and patient selection, you actually can standardize the technique throughout multiple centers. And it's fair to say that when you look at the microclip technique, people try to do it the same way and the procedure is done the same way. So there is a potential for standardization. Uh, obviously, as, as every single procedure we do, volume essentially brings expertise and better actually clinical outcomes. And not everyone should be doing, you know, uh, this type of procedures, but I really think that it does provide the opportunity for better standardization of the techniques. Yeah, can I just add one short, um, a remark um, because it really burns me. We should, when we started the, the journey on Taver Mitra, we always said, provided that our results are as good as a surgical result, you know, non invasive will prevail. Uh, that is definitely true, as you pointed out in Taver. However, we have to recognize even the surgeons made a lot of progress, maybe under the pressure of, exactly. of uh, interventional. Uh, takes because they have moved in the field also. They can do minimally invasive, mm -hmm. they can do repair much better than we start when we started out. On the mental field, if we are honest, you know, and, and you said visually, um, the differences are, are quite obvious between surgical uh, or between mentors. But if we, if we have, if we cannot achieve the same, you know, good results in interventional techniques that we can achieve with surgical results, we will have a difficult time to promote I, this for, for our patients. I absolutely agree. That's why I made an emphasis on that. And that actually goes back to your microclip question because I really think that <laughs> that over, over time, I think people will start to see the difference yeah. in, in outcomes. Yeah. Sure. Um, Antonio, did you have a comment or question before I do the okay. last two? I, I am perplexed about all these field of mitral interventions. I mean, we have seen a, a lot of uh, progress going on in the last 10 years, but except for the mitral clip, which is effective in a limited number of patients, not in a lot, even if we use it in a lot, nothing has really took off. We see every valve numbers 10, 20, 10, 9, 100, but why nothing takes off really? Maybe we need time, I have to be more patient, but so far I am perplexed because uh, the only field to me is uh, functional because degenerative, if you have a good surgeon, is much better because you can repair completely and no way the clip can uh, compete in degenerative. So our field is uh, functional. So I, I'm, I'm, I don't want to be pessimistic, but uh, if I were an investor, I will consider investing in the mitral field, the high risk investment. Why, what do you think? I mean, has that been a challenge? I mean, you you involved it, in so many devices. Yeah. No, I, I, I think, uh, I think that, so, so Antonio, I think number one, I, as I said before, I think the uh, the, the field uh, is not, uh, or the, the 
clinical need is actually bigger than appreciated. I mean, we're not really talking about valve and valve. We're not talking about valve and ring. Uh, we're not talking about the large amount of patients with uh, MAC, uh, small ventricles uh, that we actually were seeing. So I think that there is actually potential population that can be covered with uh, replacement technologies. I think that the, the biggest difficulty um, uh, at the present time is being technological because in reality, the development of these technologies is way more complex than anything that I ever seen before. So that is gonna take some time. Uh, and the second thing is actually that the, the original designs, as I said before, did not take into consideration important anatomical and geometrical challenges and variations that now we're understanding. I really think we're gonna to get to a point that once technology and, and design changes actually occur, you're going to see an exponential growth in, in, in actually use. And, uh, and I really think we're getting close to that, Antonio, with, with some technologies. I mean, you really see that, for example, um, in, in the transeptal field, only in the 12th, uh, the past year with COVID and everything, three companies already started to make progress on the transeptal field. So we're gonna start seeing that. I really think that we're gonna see that. It's gonna be generalizable, maybe not, but I really think it's going to actually get to the point that we all want. But, but how confident are you that uh, relieving uh, the matter regurgitation is going to be the answer in most of the patients, not in a group, in most? That... In the Arctic, the, the question is clear answer. But uh, um, in the functional matter regurgitation, I don't think uh, the population is so large. I, I hope to be wrong. So one, um, you know, one of the groups of patients uh, that we struggle with here at Monty um, that are referred to us in the structural program are patients with, I mean, we see a lot of patients here with calcium, with calcium on their annulus, calcium on their valve, calcium on the leaflets. So, you know, they have this very mixed uh, etiology disease, but with a lot of calcium. Now, I mean, we know CLIP is not a, um, a possibility in these patients. These are patients often who the surgeons don't want to touch either because of their comorbidities. Do you think out of all the technologies you showed us, and maybe I'm leading you on a little bit, um, there's one that put, one or two that potentially stand out to treat yes. these? Yes, and I, and I really think this is where uh, a potential opportunity to uh, unleash uh, the, the field. Because I mean, one of the things is, and as I said, people actually tend to divide this into two conditions. But when you get to certain, you know, population age uh, and population demographics, you start actually seeing a lot of patients that were unrecognized before and were managed medically. I mean, you said it, a big population, for example, is MAC. What is interesting is a lot of the companies didn't consider MAC as a variable that needed to be included in the design uh, uh, characteristics. Uh, small ventricles, you know, this is the other, um, you know, very common uh, thing, you know, valve, valve, I mean, uh, a valve in MAC, valve in ring, valve in valve, those are actually very common, um, you know, uh, conditions that you see, you know, uh, in every single center and are suboptimally treated with uh, the off-label use of some devices, you know. Jean and, and Mario, I, I would be very much interested you know, I would like to pose a provocative question or remark, if you wish. Um, I, would, I would wonder what, what you think about it. We have always been following the surgical path. We always tried to be, to follow the surgical procedures because we know what we were doing. They knew, at least for the most part, what they were doing. So we thought we could do this interventionally. We know we can do it, for example, for replacement, maybe not as good and as safety as surgeons, but on the repair field, we have to admit we haven't achieved very much. Let, let aside the clip for, for, for a moment. Do, are we going into the right direction when we always try to follow uh, our surgical colleagues and try to ramp up to the results of the surgeons? Or should we maybe, at least in some patients, enter a different pathway, like the posterior leaflet augmentation, uh, completely different from the surgeons. What you hear from the surgeons, at least from some that are very experienced, 
for example, Steve Bowling or, or Adams, they say, well, we don't know because we haven't done it. Well, if we look at innovation, truly innovation, that is beyond what we know. We have to expand the field um, of surgical expertise. And maybe, you know, these technologies that he mentioned beautifully in his talk, uh, like Half Moon or like uh, AV or, or something like this, um, maybe that's a better way for us to move and, uh, and, and go on our field independent of surgical results. One Mario, it would be great if you could comment because we all interventionists and sometimes we need a mirror held up to us about you know, the direction we're going. Are you on mute, Mario? Uh, interesting. Uh, you mentioned Steve Bowling and I uh, remember seeing a Steve Bowling presenting the initial data and it looked fantastic in terms of uh, immediate results. Uh, Long-term follow-up, uh, things fell apart. And, and, and I think it, it, it reflects on what I commented before, which is uh, that the other half of the equation here is patient selection. Uh, the, the, the difference in outcomes in, 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 in co-op uh, to mitral FR was a more careful patient selection for, for, uh, for co-op. Uh, I think the, the, the challenge here is to figure out which of these patients has a ventricular function that is good enough uh, to sustain uh, over time the benefits yes. of the mitral valve repair. <clears throat> and uh, I, I think that there are things that have been proposed out there. It's, a, it's, it's quite challenging because of the afterload uh, uh, increase that occurs after the repair, uh, which um, is diff diff difficult to quantify ahead of time, uh, what will be the impact of the procedure. But I think uh, that that is something that has to be um, taken into consideration and explore uh, more um, uh, in, in these patients. Great, thanks, Mara. I think we need to bring these rounds uh, to an end. They've been, we could carry on for the next hour, but uh, Mario's going to kill me because you know, the faculty and fellows need to get back to your work. Uh, but it was a great discussion. And I, do, I did want to end with a little bit of uh, shameless publicity for our structural heart program that one is part of. Uh, you know, many of the, of the devices you saw today, we do now have, that, have available at Monty and are part of the clinical trials to evaluate these devices. So uh, we have a lot more to offer than just the clip. And then also, I, you know, I wanted to make sure that faculty and fellows knew that, you know, based on the new valve with the heart disease guidelines, uh, that mitral clip or edge to edge repair now has a class 2A indication for functional MR after a patient's been evaluated by heart failure. Um, that's a higher indication than and surgery has. Surgery has only a class 2B indication for functional MR. And then probably the final thing about two weeks ago, uh, Medicare have now you know, approved nationally uh, mitral clip in the United States. So we can form fu functional MR so we can easily treat those patients. It's fully reimbursed. So um, just something for you all to consider. One, thank you so much. Really appreciate you taking the time. We've all learned incredible amount from you and I'm sure we'll continue to learn from you. Uh, yes, faculty. Uh, thank you again for the invitation and thank you for, uh, for attending this lecture.